Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Welcome to Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, Lance Peterson. So today I have with me Gino Barbero with, uh, well, you've got quite a few different um, things, but I think Rand Partners is your main, the main sponsor entity that you guys do deals from. Yes, we, we call it the Rand Power Wheel. So if just think of a spoke, a wheel, right? It's all the Rand family of companies and we have Rand Property Management. We have Rand Partners that does our syndication. We have Jake and Gino, which is the education. And then we have Rand Capital, which does mortgages for our students and for, for the community. So it's really called, really think of it as being multifaceted and, and uh, vertically integrated. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I, it's the, the the Jake and Gino show, right? So that's mm-hmm. the mover and shakers, the Jake mm-hmm. and Gino show. So it's yep. great. Yeah, I've been listening to it for a long time. So, yeah, thanks for joining us. It's always great to uh, to catch up and sort of pick the brain of a guy who eats, breathes, and sleeps this stuff. I think that the thing that you and I have in common, if from what I can tell, is that we both have lots of children. So it looks <laughs> looks like you've got six of them, if I'm counting yes. correctly. My yep. wife and I have five. So um, I think in you know kindred spirits in that respect for sure of guys who've got a lot going on so much so that you've got to have a wheel to explain how many businesses you've got. And, <laughs> well, you know what it is? It's very <laughs> simple, everybody. It's never the right time to have a kid, ask Lance and Gino, and it's never the right time to buy a deal, and it's never the right time to get in the multifamily until you're ready for it, right? Let's just start it out that way. Having a family, a large family, or one or two kids, and having multifamily, it's the same thing. You're running a business, you're running a family. It's the same principles, same concepts, holding yourself accountable, actually enjoying it, right? You got to have, you got to enjoy it with five kids. You must be so damn busy, right? You're running around. It's crazy, but you have to dedicate time to them, right? And if you have to dedicate time to your business, if you let one of them slide, it's going to be ruinous. So uh, I'm sure that you probably married up like I did, you know, having that amazing spouse always helps out. It's like a business partner. Jake is my business partner slash quote unquote, marriage person because I see him all the time. I've spoken to him three times already today. I'll speak to him again. Probably going to spend talk to him on Thanksgiving, you know, talking about what we need to do for the weekend. So it's an amazing, it's been an amazing journey for me and for you. I'm hopeful that you have more kids. I'm I'm at six right now. I think the wife is shutting me down, but I'm hoping, praying that you have more than five. Yeah, no, I, we shut it down. So five was the <laughs> five was the number. But but yeah, you know, for for me, it's always been, and I think it's it's uh, having you know, well, one, having children in general, it's just a humbling sort of experience. Mm -hmm. But I I feel like more than anything, that's what it's done for me is just grounded me. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, and you kind of realize what, you know, your real purpose is ultimately you want, you know, you, you, you want to raise your children to be good citizens, good humans. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it's a humbling experience because, you know, you learn really quick that, you know, once you, 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 once you have to start playing zone defense, right. Once you get two or more, like you're not, you know, you, you're not in control, right. Like, and so mm-hmm. you, you've got to be willing to let things go. And, you know, certainly, like you said, I married up as well. My wife is just amazing. She's a saint. And, uh, and, um, you know, I just feel very blessed and, and fortunate to, to have those mm-hmm. people in my life and, and, uh, but it just keeps you centered, right? Like you don't take yourself so darn seriously. And, um, so that's sort of sort of my my rationale for it, but um, but yeah, it's great to it's great to meet others who've who, who've got lots of kids as well. So um, so today, I mean, kind of digging in, you know, I think that for for you, I know you spend a lot of time educating others, getting into the business, right? So mm-hmm. you know, to become uh, multifamily syndicators, you know, obviously there's sort of the a bit of a linear progression that most people take in real estate, right? It's is sort of buy some single family and then realize, Hey, that was a lot of work. I could buy maybe four of these at a time or 16 or 24 mm-hmm. and and so on. So maybe share with us just sort of starting out, you know, kind of with the, the easy stuff here, but I mean, what's like that number one thing that you sort of teach your students to, to, to avoid or like, like, you know, I, I call it the get your ass handed to you sort of sort of play. I mean, is there is there any one thing that you sort of tell them like you got to be really careful about X when you get into this business? Well, Lance, that's a great question. I, I think the first thing, let's take a step back. I mean, at Jake and Gino, what I always tell our students is we create multifamily entrepreneurs. I think people getting into real estate don't understand that it's a business. 
and it's a scalable business. And that's the reason why you want to get into multifamily and not single family. You can actually scale it up. You have the economies of scale. Now, once you start looking at them as, you know, centers of, of, of you know, revenue, you can start buying each individual property. That's how we we're able to scale out in what we call the, the multifaceted, where you have all those different spokes. You don't start out that way. You start out by buying one property. And I think what we teach is our proprietary three-step framework. It's buy right, it's manage right, and it's finance right. Let's simply rip those down. When you're buying a multifamily deal, you need to look at it from the buy right, which we have a, a picture of a wheelbarrow, right? The back leg is the buy right. Once you do that, it's fixed. You buy that asset right. I always say no deal is better than a bad deal, right? Because I've been in some bad deals. I've, I forced it, right? I've what we what we call in the community, I've pencil whipped a few deals, right? It mm -hmm. looks really good, making those assumptions, getting a little aggressive, not really doing my underwriting properly. If you don't buy it on the right on the front end, your wheelbarrow is going to be really, you know, wobbly, as they say. Yeah. The other part, the second part is the finance, right? That's the other back leg. Once you get that nailed, and it seems like Lance, I was talking to the economist as we were talking off camera, mm -hmm. he, he's thinking in the next four or five years, we may have interest rates climbing, right? So now may be the time to get that long-term fixed rate financing where you're at 3%, three percent, three and a quarter, and lock it up. So finance rate is the other one. So we can talk about the different finance rate strategies, whether you're going to be doing owner financing, whether you're going to be doing bridge debt. We use community banks sometimes as bridge debt, or you're going to go into the agencies. So those two legs, the buy and the finance, are fixed. Now the wheel of the wheelbarrow is the manage rate. That's the one that a lot of people fault on where they think, hey, you know what? I'm going to buy these deals and I'm going to let go, and I'm just going to let them take care of themselves. That is constantly ongoing. And if you are in the business, you are either managing yourself like we are and building systems and getting better at it every day, or you're out there hiring third-party property management. So you take your choice. You pick your poison. If you're getting third-party property management, you're going to be able to scale and buy more deals, right? Because that's not a full-time endeavor. For us, we have it in-house. We have about 60 employees on the Rand property management side between maintenance techs and property managers, and we're scaling a real business. So our profit per door is much greater than the average company that's using third-party property management. It's all about goals, Lance. And to, you know, to finish your question, really everybody out there, when you're getting into it, what are your goals with multifamily? Are you doing it as a part-time endeavor to really just get some kind of retirement funds going? Are you doing this because you love the business and you want to get into it? For me, I wanted to leave my restaurant and I wanted to get into multifamily full-time. So so what I did is me and Jake, we didn't go the syndication route in our first couple of deals because syndication seven, eight, 10 years ago, there wasn't the capital out there that there is now. We were able to buy deals ourselves, be able to buy those deals, refi those deals out, repurpose the money into the next deal. We call it the conveyor belt. We're stacking on a deal in a couple of years. You've done work to it. You're able to pull it out. We were able to refinance over, you know, over $11 million in our portfolio so far. Mm -hmm. And at 1,000 units, we said, you know what? Let's try the syndication. Everyone's talking about it and it's a wonderful model, but it's only one tool in the toolbox. There's other ways to buy deals. So for everybody out there, think of what your criteria is. Set up your buy right criteria. What I mean by that is Focus on what market you're looking at. Don't go to three, four, five different markets. When you're first starting out, select a market and really learn that market well. Then figure out where your parameters are as far as cap rates, rates of return, age of the asset, quality assets, all of those things you need to set up on the front end and then start diving in and figuring out, okay, this is what I want to do. How much time do you have? When I first started out, I had limited time. I was working full time. So that's what attracted me to multifamily. I didn't want to fix and flip. I didn't want to have five or six single family homes where I was running around the city all the time. I wanted to buy a 15 or 20 unit deal that was all contiguous that I could manage a lot easier. So all of these assets, personal assets that you have, what kind of capital do you have? Are you going to be able to partner with people? These are all things you need to really think out and flesh out in the front end before you dive in head first. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, totally. I think, yeah, I like that framework. I mean, it's, you know, you hear it a lot, obviously, sort of, you know, you, you make money in real estate on the buy. I mean, but it's true. So it needs to be repeated. Is mm -hmm. that, you know, because it's, I mean, especially if it's a value add deal, I mean, you know, it's hard to recover, right? If you, if you don't get in at the right basis, Mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it, everything kind of falls apart, which goes to, of course, you have to, the underwriting is critical. You have to mm -hmm. make, and I think it, it seems to me from where I stand, you know, we're, we're more of, um, you know, at least on the Fairway America side, it's more of a capital allocator. You know, we, we kind of seek out sponsors. And so it's a different seat. You know, we're not operators like you guys. And mm -hmm. obviously on the Veravest side, I'm more of a, a service provider. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, doing deals myself. But what it seems like when I observe what crosses my desk on the administration and those things is just, that's, it, it seems like that's an issue. It's been an issue is just these overzealous assumptions 
mm-hmm. people put into their pro formas, which to me seems a bit maybe driven by the fact that, you know, that it's that they're trying to get access to capital and they feel they feel the pressure to have to, you know, project some, you know, maybe what would be an elevated IRR. Who knows? And maybe it's just that they don't really know what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. But I mean, have you seen a lot of that? Or when you kind of when you when you look at these pro formas that people come up with, I mean, how often, I mean, what percent of the time are you sort of going like, dude, are you really you're not gonna be able to move rents 250 bucks? And like that's all not gonna- the time. So let's take a little history lesson. Back when I started buying in 2011, 2012, rents for one bedrooms in Knoxville were two. 275, 300, 325 for one bedroom. Now they're at over 600 bucks, right? So you're seeing the elevation of rents over the last five, six years. That's where, that's why these, these assets have all elevated on top of, on top of a couple of other things that have, that have happened. A lot of printing of money. So inflation occurs, hard assets elevate. 1031 money. There's a ton of money out there. It's 1031 that is being replicated and being flipped into the next asset. The next thing, cost segregation with the bonus depreciation, massive. You have accountants and you have attorneys and doctors who love that. I mean, that itself can probably make some deals work. I wouldn't underwrite for that. That's what we call the cherry on top. But a lot of people do that because they find that to be very attractive. The next thing, you have a lot of family office money. I mean, basically, I think family office money back seven, eight, 10 years ago with comprised their, their portfolio about seven to 8% of real estate. I think it's doubled in the last couple of years to 15%. So you have a ton of money coming into it. And when you see private equity going into mobile home parks and into you know, multifamily, it, what the economist said to me yesterday, which is totally true, if you want to be a really good investor, you need to see where the money's flowing in and where it's flowing out. And it's been flowing into multifamily for the last couple of years. And you know, a bit of warning for everybody out there, where, where else is it going to flow into? Is it going to flow into stocks? Stocks are at an all time high. You know, the P ratios, there's not much value in stocks. It's going to be that there's a bubble there, right? But at least with multifamily, there's some type of gold standard where you're actually buying an asset, you're buying something that's hard, and it's producing some type of yield if you buy it correctly. So that's why multifamily has been elevated to me over the last couple of years. And if you, you take a look at that, I think we've seen a lot of that, Lance, where people are coming in and they're, they're they're getting two and three and four caps. It's really a place to preserve wealth. You know, they're getting they're getting those write offs, and also they're riding it out and they're buying these newer assets. And we're seeing the deltas though in the last couple of months where. People have bought a deal and then 12 months later, they're flipping that deal out. And we're seeing that a lot now. So that's telling me that we're getting to a point in the market and maybe a high point. And at the same time, you know, a seller puts a property on the market for 7 million, buyers are coming in at five. That delta is getting bigger between the seven, between the bid and ask price. And it's getting bigger and bigger. And I don't know when it's going to stop. We're going to see in the new year with the evictions coming on? Are they going to continue with the PPP money and the stimulus money? Is that going to happen? What's going to happen with the economy? That's going to tell us a lot because if we do a history lesson back in March, the world was supposed to be over by now as far as collections, as far as everything else. And for us in Knoxville, we're back to rent growth. We're back to we're back to raising rents right now. And it depending on what market you're in, really, you know, real estate is macro, but it really is micro to yeah. the sub-market and to the sub-market of the sub-market. So you really need to know where you're investing. Yeah, I mean, definitely, it's a great point. I mean, it's it's it. it I mean, this is where it's just it's unprecedented, right? We mm-hmm. we haven't people that are living, you know, today they've never experienced this sort of, you know, a pandemic, a global mm-hmm. pandemic, right? And, and and of course, when you get locked down, and I think you mentioned it, you know, you're from New York, and you know, and now all these the towns that you, you know you lived in, you know, it's everyone's migrating out, like everyone's mm-hmm. getting out of the cities, and and. You know, and that's what happens when things like this, you know, people reevaluate their situation and the circumstances, obviously, when you're bound to your home, you know, it's just, it, it's changing lots of things. But mm-hmm. I mean, the, the commonality with all of it is sort of, I think, to some degree, the appreciation for one's home, right? The, the mm-hmm. dwelling where I, where I live. And to your point on sort of, that's why one, you know, one apartment building and, <clears throat> you know, one side of town versus the other, you know, submarket, the submarket, it's like, I much rather live over there. If I'm going to be at home all day long and do whatever, I much rather live in that place. Mm-hmm. Either way, you know, people need a place to live. And let me let me make two points with that because it's really important that people need to understand about the pandemic. The pandemic didn't cause things; it just accelerated things that were happening. I'm yeah. a New Yorker. I left in 2017, three years ago, to migrate down to Florida. That was happening. That's been happening. People were already going out and leaving the workforce and going working remotely. That was already happening. Now, when Stripe is out there saying to their to their employees in California, take a 10% pay cut, go live anywhere. They're all migrating to Texas. That's just accelerating what's been going 
going on right now. So that's really important for people to understand. It's going to come back. I mean, to be honest with you, in Florida, we haven't shut down. The economy here, to me, is seems as if it's rip roaring up. I'm up in St. Augustine. Nothing's closed here, right? I mean, I think he's managed it very, very well. We have twice the number of cases and half the number of deaths in New York, and our aging population is not even close. So the yeah. mismanagement that's occurred in a lot of these areas will tell you what's going on. But you look at Tennessee's economy is doing fantastic. I mean, fantastic in relation to everybody else. I think Texas is doing rather well. Florida is doing rather well. Look at economies and look at where markets you're selecting because that's going to tell you how are you going to do going forward. Very important to point that out. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I think that is because it's everyone wants to paint things with a broad brush, right? Yes, it's, it's life. I mean, nothing in life is really that simple. I mean, you, mm-hmm. it's you know, and especially if you really you, you dig in, you think about economies in general. Like it's like, yeah, is the GDP on whole shrinking? Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. Global pandemic. But once again, you look at where it's being reallocated and and those are the things. That's how you become a good investor. I mean, I think that that's where, you know, I see certain, you know, situations where, you know, maybe it's, you know, I'm a proponent of sort of real estate crowdfunding. Clearly, you know, I I believe in that. I believe that in, you know, high to high level democratization of these things. Of course, I mean, I want more people to have access to it. Don't get me Mm -hmm. wrong, but but part of the issue you run into is some of these persuasion principles as well, which is, you know, scarcity being a very powerful driver. And so mm-hmm. what it seems to me is that when, you know, a deal could hit a crowdfunding site and be fully subscribed, you know, in six hours or maybe last six minutes, 16 minutes, whatever. I mean, once again, great for that sponsor, great for the crowdfunding operator, mm-hmm. you know, but it makes me wonder, and this is why I do this show. Cause I'm just like, it, we, you got to learn how to use your brain. You can't just follow the masses. Like, mm-hmm. you know, when you make a decision, I mean, obviously, you know, as being an active investor and operator, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. You got to look at a lot of things and make a, evaluate lots of things to make a decision to, you know, make an offer, right? Mm-hmm. Like tons of stuff happens that you say no to before you even get to the point where you're willing to make an offer. And even when you make an offer, you're still sweating it until the day you buy it. And that's no victory that the, the, it's just begun, right? But yet mm-hmm. on the flip side, from a passive investor standpoint, yeah, you don't want to be, you know, pestering the sponsor and just, you know, I mean, annoying the crap out of them. That that's not good either. But you need to think about that, right? You need to think mm-hmm. about what do I think about the Nashville market? What is going on? I know it's all covered in the offering memo, but it's like internalize it. Mm-hmm. Like think it through. Why is this a good idea? You you have to you have to think of those things, right? And 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 once again, no one has the crystal ball. So ultimately, but it's, it, I think that you can sleep better at night knowing that, okay, that deal hit this thing and I put money into it, but, but I had, there was some rationale behind why I did it. I am mm-hmm. bullish. I've, I've learned enough to know that I'm bullish on Nashville, right? I mean, I made, you know, like those sorts of, those sorts of things where back in the day, you know, like you said, syndication wasn't as popular, the crowd for the jobs act and all those things hadn't passed yet. So, you know, you, you, you were kind of forced, even if you invested in a passive capacity to sort of stick to whatever town you lived in, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's the deal flow that you had. And now you have access to deal flow across the whole country, right? I mean, like you said, you live in Florida, your operations are based in Nashville, you have New York. I mean, like it's, it's beautiful. It's great Mm -hmm. that we can do this, but it means that you do have to be, you have to pay a lot, you know, very close attention to what's going on. And that's how you can become a good investor. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so it's just, those are the things that, and that's why I like having these sort of conversations. You mentioned that you had this economist on, you know, your show yesterday. So maybe you can share some other insights that that he had because it sounded like, which is which is refreshing. He was a bit more bullish on what's ahead, whereas you know you you know I, I follow Ray Dalio, whatever. I mean, you know he, you know he, or what? <laughs> some of these guys they're just sort of doom and gloom, like you know things aren't going well. Whereas it sounded like this guy was looking at a little bit different. Well, he's just looking at the flows of money, right? He's looking at what we call the MMT. He calls it the magic money tree. There's a lot of money right now. That's why these assets are still elevated. There's a lot of money being printed and it's sitting out there and it's not going to work itself through the system for another two years. So he doesn't see inflation occurring for the next two years, right? So buy these assets now. You're going to get, you have, it's unprecedented, these 3% interest rates. If you think interest rates are going to rise in the next five years and you can lock in long term fixed rate financing at 3%, that's really cheap. Cheap money. He's talking also about the economy, how un- unemployment is down, is 
bounced down to 6% right now, right? GDP is roared back. So a lot of these things, I was discounting like you, Lance. I'm like, I'm a little doom and gloom. But when you extract yourself out of it and you take your emotions out of it, when you're an investor, you can't be emotional about something. Mm -hmm. You can't have the fear of missing out. Listen, I'm, I'm, I bought a little crypto this last couple of weeks. I'm doing really good with Ripple and with Stellar, doing fantastic with them. I'm going to let them sit there three years from now. If they're at 50 bucks, great. If they're 50 cents, great. That's not investing to me. That's speculating and having a good time. Let's yeah. separate the two, right? That, yeah. that there's a big misnomer, right? To me, the stock market, I mean, unless you're, you know, unless you're writing puts and calls and you're a, a dividend investor, that's more of a speculative gamble for me also, because I don't control what, what Tesla does. If Elon goes online and starts doing, you know, bong hits on Twitter and the stock falls 30%, I don't have any control. I can control my multifamily and I can control my portfolio. So let's separate that also. I think it's really important. And as an investor, when you're looking at a deal, the first thing you need to look at is the sponsor. If the sponsor is great, all right, then take it to the next step. The next step is you yourself, the investor. If that sponsor is doing fix and flips and flipping out every two to three years, but you're a long-term hold kind of person and you don't want to see your money, there's no good fit there, right? That's the important thing. And if that investor is investing in Portland as a sponsor, and I don't want to be in Portland because of the riots and because of the affordable housing, and because then maybe I don't select that. So you need to look at yourself as the investor and what goals do you have? The sponsor should already be talking to you about it and trying to find, you know, I, we call it finding impact together, right? If there's no finding impact together, if we can't help each other out as sponsor and investor, it's not a good fit. Let's not work together. But if we do, but that also means the investor needs to know what he wants or she wants. Where's that money coming from? Are you using IRA money? Are you using savings? Are you using whole life? You have to have a plan mapped out and not just go and do a deal because you have some extra capital. Lay out a plan. See what you want to do. Try to create you know, a plan for your entire assets and then from there, allocate to whatever you want to. I have nothing in the stock market. I'm all in multifamily and I have some whole life. I like that vehicle. That's that, that's my investing okay. criteria for me. I can control it and my businesses are tied to it. So that's what I like. But everybody out there should have some type of real estate in their portfolio because going forward, long-term, that's where it is. It's a hard asset. And I just think it's, it's look, demographically speaking, we can get into demographics. There are going to be renters galore in the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Not enough affordable housing units. And that's just that's just the way demographics are lining up. You know, baby boomers are selling out their McMansions and coming down to the Southeast and renting nice apartments. And millennials, if God forbid they don't decide to kill that student debt, they're not buying homes. They're starting out families at a later age and they're renting. Why wouldn't you want to rent? 1500 bucks for a two bedroom in a downtown. And when you're done, give the keys and move on to the next one. I do that every day of the week. So buying habits are different. You know, the American dream is, is, is shifting right now. So if you don't realize that, that's why another, another reason to get back to multifamily. That's another reason why that's the sector has been hot because there's demand for it. Yeah. And I, I agree. And that's, like you said, it's just look these, these aren't the pandemic accelerated a bunch of trends that were already taking place. Mm -hmm. I mean, the gig economy and it's just mm -hmm. pe people, it, it's the whole notion of ownership of things is just changing, right. And mm -hmm. how they look at it. And I think that's in separating them. Cause once again, and I think that's, that's a beautiful thing, right? Like, you know, you can own investment real estate and rent a house. Like <laughs> yep. why not? Right. Uh -huh. Or what, whatever. Right. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's like things like cars, it's, they're not really assets. They don't make you money. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're a drag on you. Right. That's why Uber, you know, or, or, or whatever. So it's happening, whether you agree with it or not, that's a, that's a different thing. But like you said, it's like, that's emotional. It's, mm -hmm. you got to look at what's happening and, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and assess it from that perspective. Um, so, you know, we will kind of wrap up here, but the, so I guess, and I'm sure you've got lots of stories because you've got students and you've been doing this a long time, but like, what's the biggest sort of implosion you've seen where something just went completely sideways in a deal? And I mean, and even if it's obviously I'm a, I love the fraud story. So I'm like, I, cause I'm the, my whole thing is I'm the anti Ponzi scheme guy. Like as administrators, mm -hmm. we're sort of like the referees of the space. And so, you know, we wake up and our whole team is, you know, set out to ensure that no one is wronged and things are fair and equitable. But mm -hmm. I mean, have you heard of any things that are, were crazy or just once again, are just incompetence of just doing a dumb deal that, you know, lost a bunch of money, any, anything juicy? Oh, I mean, I could tell you my stories, right? I'll, I'll tell you my stories. But I think the first thing is, you know, we're all on this, you know, social media merry-go-round, right? We're all out there seeing that Lance is doing 300 units. Jake and Gino's doing 700 units. Well, I've got to get into a 100 unit deal. If you're getting into multifamily, start small. Think big, but start small. Just start because I'll guarantee you when you buy that five flex or that eight unit, all of a sudden, 
it gets to be a little bit easier. That first deal is proof of concept. Our first deal is a 25 unit deal, Jake and I. And from there, we did a 36 unit. And then the third deal was 136 unit. Then the fourth deal was a 22 unit. So it's all about the quality of the deal and the quality of your goals. When I first started out, you know, investing back in, let's say, 04, 05, you know, the market was rip roaring hot. The biggest thing I can tell you is education times action equals results. That That's what we truly believe in. I was taking massive action back in 04 and 05, right? I was not educated. I got involved with a dude who bought a mobile home park. Now, he was a dirtbag, but ultimately it fell upon me. I didn't know the space. I didn't know the two words that we all should you know, go to sleep at night as investors, due diligence. I didn't do my due diligence because I didn't know how to do due diligence. I didn't fly down to the parks in Florida. I didn't know what a cap rate was. I didn't know how to analyze the deal. I had money. He had experience. A man with money meets a man with experience. The man with the experience gets the money. Yeah. And the man with the money gets the experience. That happened to me. So I can go out there and say how much of a criminal and how negligent he was. He created a syndication, but he didn't have any paperwork for it. The whole nine yards, that's fine. But ultimately, it fell upon me. It took a couple of years to get out of that rut and say, you know what? Mobile home park is not the problem. He's not the problem. Ultimately, I was the problem. And I think we always end up making mistakes and want to blame others. You know, Ray Dalio says ego and blind spots. Those are the two big things that, that mess up an investor, right? When I figured out that I've really got to learn this space, I found out, went out, I sought a mentor. At the time, I said, I'm going to pay for my education. Now it's just an investment in education, right? It's when you're an entrepreneur, you look at those things as investments. Whereas if you're just a regular person, W-2 or not educated, you look at them as costs. Yeah. They're not costs. They're investments. And I learned so much about multifamily from my first two mentors that I was able to buy that deal with Jake. Jake knew nothing about investing back in 13. I was, quote unquote, his mentor. He was boots on the ground in Knoxville and I'm buying from New York. We're doing it together. That was the most important thing, I think, Lance, when I first started out. I didn't have due diligence and I didn't really understand. Listen, go out there and partner with people who have experience. If yep. you're out there and you're looking to get into multifamily and you can raise a little bit of capital, maybe find a sponsor who needs you to help them raise a little bit of capital. That's a great way to get into it. Or maybe you got 20, 30, 20, 30 50 grand sitting in an IRA. Be an LP in a deal. See what the process looks like. Earn while you learn. I mean, that's a great way to get into it. And you know, you don't have to rush into things. Rome wasn't built in a day. Listen, I got out of the restaurant and became financially free within three years of the first deal Jake and I bought. Let's say a total of five years from when we first started looking for deals to when I left my full-time W-2 restaurant, right? It doesn't have to take that long, but you really have to be focused and you really have to have a plan and you know, have to have those goals and working on them all the time. And the thing is, people are just have that shiny object syndrome. One day it's self-storage, one day it's mobile home parks, one day it's multifamily. Pick a niche, whatever niche you choose, learn it and do really well on it. Now, re would I pick retail right now? Probably not. Office space, probably not. There are yeah. some niches that are better than others, but focus on one. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think that hits that. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, I mean, that, that's what it is, right? Like you, you if you're going to get into it, you're, you're going to have to, there's, it's not, there's no hockey sticks in this thing. Nope. You can't, there's no shortcut. There's no, none of that doesn't exist. Like this real estate investing, no matter whether you're active, passive, whatever, it's a long game, right? And mm -hmm. it's going to require you to learn things that you didn't know, like anything, mm -hmm. right? But I think mm -hmm. to your point though, that's what, that's the beauty of it. Like the stock market, I mean, once again, like it's not my bailiwick either, obviously, you know, but it, it just, it, 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 it's, Okay, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a good investment. What I do know is that there's so many moving parts, and it's so crazy complicated. Mm -hmm. And and you can't help but feel like you're you're someone's manipulating it, even though they're not supposed to be, <laughs> right? Like yes. so, you know, maybe it just speaks to like just more simple minded or something. But you know, although real estate investing is complicated, you know, it's just at least there's there's something tangible, and there's only so much dirt. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, we're proponents of it. And and but it's just realizing that. But to your point. It, it does come down to, it's like you, if you get into something, you're going to have to pick, pick, pick the niche, right? If it is mm -hmm. like, if, cause like for me, I've, I've, I've done a couple of these podcasts now with some mobile home park guys and, you know, like mobile home park investing is a great example. I mean, it's really hot now and it's really sexy and people think it's great. Um, you know, but like there's, there's conviction there. Cause to your point is people are retiring and they're moving and they're whatever. I mean, a lot of these people are going to land in mobile home parks, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that, that could be a good sort of solution for those who maybe didn't do enough planning. But the point is that you got to have conviction about something. You got to have some passion about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, like you can't help every few minutes, right? You bring up, you're passionate about multifamily. Mm -hmm. You believe in every, you know, you believe in it to your core because of what it can do for communities and for people and for, you know, like it, it just has so many benefits to it. And, 
you know, that's what makes it, you know, exciting, but you can't just be the shiny object. It doesn't work because mm-hmm. flipping from multifamily to mobile home parks, to self-storage, to whatever, like the, to, I mean, it, it's, it, there's so many subtle differences, like self-storage is a great example. I mean, it's, it's going the way of sort of like airline tickets and hotel rooms. I mean, the, 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 the way that, that a unit is priced, I could walk into a place today and be quoted, you know, $36 for a unit and I could walk, I could come back in two weeks later and it's 118. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a different animal now. I mean, like Mm -hmm. the big units and stuff. And so that's not like we, this, this two bedroom is $950 a month. I mean, and it's not demand pricing. Now, maybe someday Mm -hmm. we end up there, but that's days, not today. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, it really does come down to it's investing. Investing requires an investment in education, in understanding, you know, and being curious and, and poking into it, right? Like mm-hmm. if, you know, Nashville's interesting as an outsider, but before I'd invest in Nashville, just like I'm sure you guys did, it's like, you know, maybe you take a trip there. Maybe you, you poke around and you see what Nashville's really all about. And you ask a lot of questions and, you know, so it's, it's even as a passive investor, you can be more active, right? And, and, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, and that's what we're after here on this sort of podcast is just people people thinking about it a little bit differently. Don't be afraid of it. It's okay to ask dumb questions. Mm-hmm. It's okay to lean in and just think of, think about it. Like, why would I do that? Why are they doing that? Why are they buying that? Why do they think that that's a good idea? Um, so anyway, good good stuff. Uh, any parting thoughts? Anything that that pressing we need that we need to get up before we let you go? Well, I think the only thing is that we talk about, I'm not saying don't ever deviate from what you're doing, right? I'm just saying, get really good at it. I mean, I don't mind looking at self-storage now yeah. after doing this 10 or 15 years. I'm, I'm educating on it. But at the same time, you know, I've seen people who are so successful. And then all of a sudden, I've seen people who really have so much talent, but they're jumping from being a salesperson to investing in Bitcoin to investing in mobile. I mean, it's just amazing where they can't focus all their energies and everything you do, Lance, in life, whether you want to be successful, if a family is a perfect example, I'll, I'll end with this. If you want to be successful as, as a father, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, I've got a daughter who's 21 years old and I've got a daughter who's six years old. It's been the long game. I, I've been doing this for years and years and years. And Real estate, investing, going to college, being good at something, it is the long game, no matter what you do. So focus on what you want to do and try to get good at it and continue to hone your craft. You know, commencement speech when you graduate college, you graduate college, it doesn't mean you have stopped learning. Actually, the commencement speech is that's when you really start to learn. People get it backwards. They're like, I'm done with school, I'm no more reading. No, that's when you actually start your learning when you graduate college and go into the real world. So it's all about growth. You know, either by, you're the growing or you're dying. Yep, that's right. That's exactly right. It always comes, mm-hmm. always comes back to that. Well, it's good stuff, man. It's great catching up. 